I'm here with Chad Olek. Chad Olek is front of house for Fallout Boy. And? Uh, currently just Fallout Boy, but in the past I've done Shine Down, I've done Deftones, I've done Joe Jonas, I've done Alice in Chains, uh, did a short stint with Linkin Park, uh, uh, Puddle of Mud, a whole bunch of others. It seems like a couple of those bands might go somewhere if they really. I was hoping that if, if they got some practice in, they, they might get a Maybe career. they might. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my first question is how did you get into running sound? Uh, bad luck. Uh, <laughs> or failed musician, as we all A 100% failed musician. I wanted to be a musician in the worst way. What's your instrument? Uh, none well. Uh, I tried to play bass. Actually, I originally started off on drums and quickly learned that my four limbs do not operate independent of each other. So there was no way that I was going to do anything with that. Yeah. Uh, so I moved over to bass, which allegedly was the easiest instrument, and I still failed. Okay. Um, did that for a while. Right after high school, moved out to Los Angeles. Uh, was going to uh, was going to go to uh, MIT and uh, or BIT to be exact, okay. uh, and become a yeah world famous yeah, baseball. MIT uh, Musicians Institute of Technology. Oh, okay. I thought it was like the MIT. No, not Mass Institute. Okay. Musicians <laughs> Institute. The you know the, the 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 music nerds, not the math nerds. Okay. Um, so I went there, tried to do that. Uh, I toured the school. I didn't like it. So I ended up going to a school out there called the University of Sound Arts, which uh, is now defunct. Okay. Uh, but they had a mass comm degree that kind of, they did it in a kind of different way where it was a lot of recording stuff, like a lot of studio stuff. Yeah. Uh, not as much of the, uh, what I would call the classic uh, college stuff. Sure. <clears throat> so I did that uh, after a while, moved back home, started working local clubs, uh, you know, kind of still trying to do local bands at that point. The local bands were uh, mostly, well, there's a couple good ones, but mostly not good. Sure. Um, and uh, yeah, just kind of, I ended up doing front of house uh, for my friend's band at a club because the front of house guy was just wasted. Uh, so I was like, well, I've done some studio stuff. It's kind of the same thing, right? And uh, that's kind of how it started. Okay, so uh, make the connection for me from that to <coughs> Fallout Boy. Actually, hold up. Your first tour, your first big tour, who was it? First first real tour was a band called Orange 9mm. Okay. Uh, they were a New York City hardcore band. Okay. Uh, I was running sound for a local band out of Boston called Knock, uh, who uh, were a really regional band. We did like as far down as New York and, you know, Mass, New Hampshire, Maine, Vermont, that kind of thing. Um, Orange 9 opened for them. They're the front of house guy at the club, they had just fired their front of house guy. The front of house guy at the club that night uh, had a bit of a rough time with it. There was a lot of feedback, so I kind of just nudged and went, hey, what if we did this? Or, yeah. you know, a little, you know, try and give a little helping hand. And uh, the drummer approached me afterwards and asked me if uh, I was interested in touring. So I handed him my business card because you had business cards at that point in time. And uh, he called me like two or three days later. And about seven or eight days later, I was on a Greyhound to New York City to meet them because they didn't have any money. So what was the first tour that was like, Wow, I'm here. So you look back on, you're like, oh my I mean, God. as a headliner, it, yeah. would, it would be, I think maybe Mudvayne? Okay. Or no, no, POD. POD, P awesome. Probably POD. Okay. Yeah, POD in like 2004. That was my first concert um, I ever went to was POD. In 2004? Uh, no, before oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I did the, the, the Pable on Death record cycle for them, and that was Kind of the first time I was like, ah, all right, I'm, I'm actually doing something. Like, yeah. I mean, I'd worked with a lot of good bands before that, uh, but none that were, you know, it was all club stuff. Yeah. And it was no arenas and stuff like that. So that was kind of my first foray into the, the, the bigger side of things. Do you feel that your approach to mixing has stayed the same since then? Or do you feel like it's, it's a little bit different? I'm sure that it's, it's constantly evolving, but yeah, your general approach to it. My general approach is, approach is the same. I do do a bit more with... Um, like, I don't know, you know what? I really don't. Uh, it's, it's pretty much the same. Okay. Yeah, like, I mean, I guess the only difference is uh, it does, my, my mix varies based on the band. Oh, yeah. Sure. So, so if I'm doing a pop act, it's way different than doing a metal act. Uh, you know, so I, yeah, so I approach it differently. What do you feel like was your, the biggest mistake you made starting off mixing that you look back now going mm, maybe that wasn't the best idea i mean leaving your console muted at the top of a giant festival show is definitely high that might list. be it uh with orange nine millimeter the first big show first big show i did with them was a radio festival in, in virginia beach i think it was called 
I think it was Lunatic Luau. I might be wrong, but I was on a PM4K. Okay. It was the first time ever on a PM4K. The systems engineer had everything muted and uh, had subgroups muted as well. And I didn't, at that point, I barely knew what subgroups were. Sure. So I unmuted my channels and not my subgroups. And the band started and nothing came out. It was horrifying. It was, uh, to, to this day, that is one of the worst experiences I've ever had. Oh. Uh, that and I had a console crash once, and that was equally as bad. What console? Uh, profile. And it was, I mean, as much as we all tool on profiles nowadays. Sure. At the time, it was pretty it was, much the best there was. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and it was really wasn't the console's fault. Uh, that didn't have normally. I had five mix engines or five mix cards, or whatever they called them, installed. Yeah. This console only had four installed, and with the amount of plugins I was using, it just it just crashed. So sitting where you're at now, uh, what mistakes do you see younger engineers making? Um, I think one of the bigger mistakes we see, especially when a, a young engineer goes from clubs to an arena. Yeah. Um, is trying to get the same feel as a tiny club with an oversized PA. Expand on that a little bit. You end up with Symphony of Kick Drum. Uh, yeah, Lead like, Kick Drum? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it, it's all kick drum all the time. Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, I guess maybe for some acts it works, but not for the majority. So what's your advice to, to not do that? Um, ask questions. Listen, listen to the other bands, you know, and then try and make, try and emulate you know, even if someone doesn't like my mix, I feel like it's moderately well balanced. Yeah. You know, like you're not going to go, uh, all I heard all night was the kick or, sure. or the snare or the vocal sure. or whatever, you know. Um, just try and make your mix a little more even. Listen to a lot of records. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's no different than, I mean, what we do is, I shouldn't say it's no different than the studio stuff, but it's a similar approach where it has to be a well balanced mix. Yeah. So. Um, I see a Digico Quantum 5. Yes. Why the Quantum 5? Um, honestly, I was on the SD5 forever. Okay. Um, since 2014, I believe. Okay. Um, I ended up on the Quantum kind of by mistake. They, they didn't have a regular SD, so I took a Quantum. And then now, having used it, I was like, well, now I'm not going backwards. Yeah, you know, <laughs> now that I've got it, I've, I've got the extra it's processing. Like driving the new car. I can't get yeah. back to my car now. <laughs> yeah, I've got the extra processing. I've got the, you know, I've got the, the spice rack and all yeah. that stuff I can delve into and, and, and mess with. So it, there, there's no sense in stepping backwards, so to speak. Did you play around with any other ones or did you just have it in your mind like, hey, I want to do Digico? Uh, no, so back when I went moved from Profile, I went to Claire uh, and demoed, over the course of three days, I demoed six different consoles. I demoed a Midas, a Studer, uh, the Digico, obviously, uh, an SSL. Uh, good Lord. And two others that I don't remember. Uh, I think, oh, a Calrac. Uh, and... Wow. And something else. Okay. So I basically said, give me the six best consoles you have, and I'm going to try them all. So, okay. Uh, Fallout Boy, yes. how many inputs? Uh, we are through 30, 38, 40, 42, 38 or 42. Okay. That's yeah. not a ton of inputs. Well, it's a four piece you know, rock band. Uh, yeah. Triggers involved with that? No triggers. No. Uh, tracks involved with that? We do, we do, oh, let me turn that down. Okay. Uh, we do have some track, yeah. Okay. Um, we have, uh, the, the, and the track for, for us is mostly just stuff that um, mostly just stuff that we can't get from the musicians on stage. Sure. So it's strings, it's uh, organs, synths, uh, stuff like that. Uh, there's a little bit of BGVs in there, um, but there's no actual actual singing, no actual guitars, no actual bass, no actual drums. Yeah. I do want to explain real fast. When artists use tracks, it's not necessarily some... Uh, genres use tracks very heavy and they rely on that, but typically speaking, and not typically speaking, um, when you record an album, there's a lot of instruments there that you cannot replicate there. So a lot of bands have to use it in order to replicate. It doesn't mean that they're not playing. Obviously, they're playing. Don't yeah. get me wrong, some bands are really heavy on that, but I think what really what you're saying is that for this one, it, it's, it's just pretty much, yeah, I mean, for just, them to do, on it. <laughs> yeah, well, for them to do, to, to replicate the album live, we'd have to have a six-piece string section and an eight-piece horn section. Well, why and, not? Why don't you have it here? Uh, I mean, I've toured with string sections and it's not fun. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd much rather not. Um, but yeah, so, so for them to get all of that extra sauce yeah. on the top, they'd, they'd have to have 
at least eight or ten extra musicians. I, I think it's a common misconception, though, and they hear tracks like, oh, crap, the band's faking it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, you can, if the tracks went away, it would still sound... Well, that's, so that's what I've always said with this camp. Like, if, if the track shut off tomorrow, there's about ten of us here that would know, aside, outside of the band, obviously. Yeah. yeah, like, with the exception of two or three songs where there's, like, a horn intro or a string intro, it, it, it's there, it's in the mix, yeah. but it's not the mix. Yeah. The mix is still just guitar, bass, drums, vocals. Uh, let's talk uh, drums. Parallel compression? Yes. So okay. I, have, uh, I have the kit run, and then I run it through to a group, and that group hits my Stam Audio uh, S4000 uh, little 500 rat compressor. Okay. Uh, it's their, uh, their version of the SSL 4000. 4, okay. Um, so yeah, uh, so I run drums into that. And uh, yeah, that's it. But that's the only start. That's the only parallel compression I use on the whole thing. On the whole, not show, vocals, yeah. nothing else. No, not doing anything with that. Um, everything comes out. Uh, everything comes to me and just comes back out for the most part. I have compression on Patrick, but okay. I don't have anything. No parallel compression on him. Okay. Um, what about spatial? Do you do much panning? Not a ton, believe it or not. We do. Okay. Um, the guitars are panned, and the, you know, the tracks are panned, but the guitars are only panned to like I don't know, ten and two. Yeah. You know, it's it's a big room, and not everybody's sitting center. So I don't want to go super High wide over there. <laughs> yeah, I mean the drums are slightly panned. Like I mean, let's see, my drums are. I mean, you can see right here they're center, 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 slightly off, slightly off, slightly off, slightly off. You know, so I'm, I mean those are those are more like what would that be eleven and one? Yeah. You know, so I, I want everybody to hear everything. So it's it's not a full mono mix, but it's a it's pretty close to a mono yeah. mix. Uh, I think one thing that engineers have a hard time with, specifically beginning engineers, is creating space frequency-wise for everything and, and uh, not just listen to the guitar, make the guitar sound good, and then do everything else on top of that where mm -hmm. you get overlapping. How do you, how do you handle that and how do you create that, be able to hear each individual thing? Because sometimes when you solo it, it may not sound great, but in the space, in the context oh, of everything. 100%. There's definitely, and, and with this band, it's a little different. Um, I haven't had as much trouble with that, but I have had artists in the past where if you sold something, you're like, oh my God, that's the worst sure. sounding I've ever heard. But in the mix, it's fine. Sure. Uh, here, luckily, the guys are using uh, modelers now for their, for their rigs, and they sound phenomenal. Um, so all I do, honestly, is trial and error. Yeah. I, I, I pull it up and then I just start messing with it. Do you do I, much soloing at all, or do you do, do the whole thing in context of the thing? I usually together? start individually, so I get it so I like the sound of everything by itself. And then, and then I'll throw it all up together and then tweak from there. One thing I found amazing that I haven't seen much is that a lot of the sound check you were doing was PA muted. Uh, well, that's because the band on this tour is doing songs that the audience uh, doesn't know that they're going to do. Oh, got it. So, got it. so there's two or three songs a night that, the, that, that are surprise songs. Oh, so they're not played that's through the cool. PA. I love that. So, yeah, I mean, then the songs that haven't been played in 10, 15, 20 years sometimes. Every night's different? Uh, every, pretty much, yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, so there's yeah anywhere between two and four songs a night that are that are different. So his voice is an iconic voice and sounds amazing. What are you doing with his voice? So uh, not a ton on EQ. Uh, I've got just a, I mean, uh, just a couple little cuts on EQ oh, aside from a, anything. Yeah, aside from a low pass, and then it comes over here, and it goes into a Neve preamp, and out of the Neve preamp into a 545 uh, primary source into a Poltec EQ, which also doesn't have a ton going on, and then into a Inward Connections Brute uh, uh, compressor. Can you walk us through your, since we're here, can you walk yeah. us through your outboard rack? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so this first 500 rack, uh, I guess I'll just go this way, which is a little backwards, but uh, this first 500 rack has uh, uh, Pete's, uh, sorry, Patrick's vocal, Joe's vocal, and Pete's vocal. Uh, and that's all that's in this rack. Uh, I have a 545 on each guy. Um, Patrick and Joe, because they do most of the most of the actual sing, like sing songy singing. Mm -hmm. uh, I have both through preamps. I have Patrick, like I said, through a Neve. Joe's going through an API. Um, Pete does mostly talking and he sings as well, but it's mostly talking between sets, uh, songs rather, and uh, and uh, a lot of the scream stuff is him. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't have I don't have him on a, a preamp, at least not at this time. Uh, then we come down to the next 500 rack. I've got my my drum crush. I've got my snare verb. This is actually just uh, it's actually not in use at the moment. 
the 510 is the DBX 120, uh, 120 XP, but in a 500 rack size. And then I have Pete's base channel, which is uh, an SPL along with a purple action uh, compressor. And then we get down to, uh, this is all my drums. I have my kick channel, which is a uh, primary source enhancer. So I'm using the primary source enhancer from SSL. I'm sorry, from Rupert Neve. Good Lord. Uh, from Rupert <laughs> Neve uh, on uh, almost as a gate, uh, actually as a gate on all my drums. So I've got the kick drum goes from that into the uh, transit designer, into the new uh, pump by Empirical Labs, uh, which is... I like know, it. It's, it's kind of, I love it so far. It's like, it, I've only been using it for seven shows now, uh, but I love it. It's very much like the Distressor. Okay. Uh, it's kind of, it's, I mean, they came out to be kind of the 500 version of the Distressor. It's yeah. not quite the exact same, but it's close enough for my money. Okay. Um, and then the snare has the exact same processing uh, as the kick. And then the two toms, he only has two toms. It's uh, the, tra uh, the, the uh, primary source and the transient designer for the rack and floor. And then the next step down, this is Patrick's guitar. Uh, stereo guitar, run it through the BSS uh, for some uh, bandwidth compression and then into the uh, uh, 5254 for the overall compression. And then the D2 at the bottom is not in use yet. That'll be next leg of the tour. Okay. Uh, we'll be moving Joe. Right now, Joe's guitar is actually right here. Joe's guitar is through the UAD and it's an SSL channel strip into a distressor, into a DSer. Is it the um, only plugins you're using? That's the only plugins I'm using, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I see a cream liner over here as well. Yeah, and then we come over to this rack and the first three channels uh, are my master, my master bus. I've got the Portico, I've got the Stam 4000 uh, a Mark III, and the Cream Liner, and then uh, the Eventide H8000, which I have uh, using a uh, micro pitch shift on Patrick's vocal a little bit, and then two Lexicon units, uh, and, an, and a TC unit for reverbs and delays. And then down bottom I have, uh, so the very bottom unit, like I said, is the Galaxy 64, which I just got on this tour. Um, it's a great uh, 64 in, 64 out, analog to digital. Uh, oh, A to D. A to D converter. Yeah. Uh, and it's also my clock. Oh, okay. So, man, this is the first time in a while I haven't seen someone using an RME. The RMEs are great too, you know. Yeah. Um, I talked to a bunch of people, uh, a bunch of people that I trust, and uh, everybody was raving about the Galaxy, so I figured I'd give it a shot. And so far, I'm, this is show number eight or nine with it. And uh, I'm knock on you knock on some kind some of wooden type wood product somewhere. Uh, over it's, here. it's uh, it's worked really well. Uh, it took a little getting used to for me just because of the the, uh, I'm, the interface is totally different from anything I've used before. So, yeah, pretty bit pretty easy, but still took a day to kind of work my way around it. And that runs into the DD2 from Opticore, which turns it into HMA uh, fiber. Okay, so then it comes into the desk and the, the, the Digico sees it as another rack. Sure. Uh, how much native are you running? Oh, I'm sorry. How, how much, much native pro or, uh, effects are you? Uh, everything's here. Nothing on here? Nothing on here, no. Oh, cool. Yeah. Your approach to uh, sound check and mixing, I know for this one you have an SC that goes out with you. Do, yes. you, do you do much with it or do you just have full trust that he's going to take care of all of it? Do you have a song you listen yeah, to so, or are you so, more of a white noise person? No, I'm not a noise. So I'm so poorly educated when it comes to the SE <laughs> side of things. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm I'm very special in that regard. Yeah, binaural guy. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a turn knob till it sound good. Yeah, you know? Mongo turn knob sound good. <laughs> We're good. Um, so uh, Steve, my SE on this, uh, takes care of all that. I do come out and play a song. You know, but not even a full song. I play about during the show. Oh no, well, you know, <laughs> if I'm bored. Yeah. Um, I come out and play uh, a bit of uh, Faith No More Strip Search, uh, which has this nasty two to three K thing. Make sure that that's not where I make sure that's where I want it to be. Yeah. And then I play about a half of a song or a song from, from Fall Out Boy from last night's show. Oh, cool. Oh, And do, okay. yeah, do virtual sound check for, you know, anywhere between a half a song and a song. Sure. Depending on the day and depending on how it feels. And then, uh, yeah, and then uh, off we go to line check. Talk to me about the PA. Uh, PA is Claire Cohesion. Uh, I've been on this PA since it came out pretty much. I think the, uh, I love it. I keep specking it for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, at this point, especially even though I've been a Claire client for 
14 years or so, I think. Um, so I, before this was the i3 and before that was the i5 and you know, so on down the list. And I, you know, I kind of came up from the Shoko side. Okay. Um, a lot of the first clients I worked with were either they were Shoko, with Shoko or they were on tours that were Shoko. So when Claire bought Shoko, I kind of just went the same direction. You know? I like it. My account rep moved over, so I moved over and uh, you know, he's since passed, but uh, I've stayed with them and uh, stayed with them and, uh, and continue uh, moving on as they move on. I love it. Well, I think they're done with, do you, can we see some microphones oh, of up course. there? Can we walk, walk on stage? You yeah, guys yeah. wanna come join us up on stage? Yeah, and we'll go, let's go take a look. Come see what they got with us. Awesome. Is it all in ears for this? Uh, yes, every, all four bands are all in ears. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, all four so bands are clean, all in ears. Clean, twice stage. Yeah, drums only. Yeah. I mean, and we don't, we don't even have amps on stage. Like I said, we're all modeling. So, wow. And we actually haven't had amps on stage in uh, several years. Even when we had amps, we were, uh, we were doing uh, ISO cabs back in, the, back in the analog, the old analog days of a year and a half ago. All right, they're gonna fork on this thing. Yeah, this is uh, first band's drum kit. Everybody's favorite subject, because all of us sound people love good sounding drums. And part of good sounding drums is it, well, source the, tone the, the and drum microphone. Helps. It is. And a good uh, drummer. And a good drum tech, because he's the guy that has to tune the thing. Um, so, and actually, is that right? Oh, that's okay. Um, so, yeah, Andy's kit, he's using a Thomas Star Classic. Uh, is this a drum tech? This is, yeah, it's a Scott R drum tech. Um, 14 inch snare, 12 and 16. Yeah. 12 and 16 inch toms, 20 inch kick. Um, he just switched over to Tama this year. Beautiful uh, set, by the way. Yeah, it's a great, the flat black's set. great. It's a, it's a great looking kit. Uh, we, are, we are all shore endorsed. Um, so all of all the mics on stage, every mic we have is all shore. I love it. Uh, so do we. Uh, you know, we. It, it, I, I said, said pretty much my whole career. If there's any company, if I can only use one company to mic everything, it would be shore. Okay. Right? Every other company has some great products. Yeah. But they're the only ones I think that can do the entire deck. All right, you gotta do a gig. You only get two microphones for everything. What two microphones? A fifty-seven. Just take the one. Just the one, not even the 58, one. just the one? 57. <laughs> but, all right, we'll go with 58 for vocals, sure. Okay, but, okay. Yeah. What drew you to Sure? Um, I've worked with them off and on for years. Um, the band was already, the band's from Chicago. Uh, the band was already endorsed when I got here, I believe. Yeah. I think they were endorsed when I got here. Okay. Um, and I'd worked with a ton of Shore artists in the past. Like, it seems most of my career has been with Shore endorsed artists. Yeah. Um, which is fortunate because I like their product, so it makes it easy for me. Yeah. Um, the uh, yeah, so so they were already on it. We've just, we, we've changed some of the mic selections over the years, um, but we haven't done anything haven't done anything weird. That's my next question: Is how much say did you have in these microphones? Are these when you picked yourself? Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, so when I first got here, there was a slightly different configuration of microphones on the kit. Uh, that monitor engineer left, and uh, when he left, I changed things to the way that I want for the new guy coming in. He wouldn't know any different, so. I changed it the way I wanted without having to worry about, you know, without really having to worry about the, the monitor engineer, like having to readjust his whole yeah. thing for the band. I don't want it to be weird for the band. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, so yeah. So we went to went to this configuration. Uh, I love your snare mic. Uh, the fifty the fifty six. Yes. Yep. So I love that. And tell the people why the fifty six. Well, so I went to normally I would have a fifty seven, uh, but I went to the fifty six because it's metal. And if it gets whacked with a stick, it's not going to break. Um, not that, yeah. You know, luckily, Andy's fairly accurate, and I haven't had a stick hit on the on a on a mic in quite a while. But uh, rather than take a chance of the, the the head of a fifty-seven popping off mid-show, sure. These are you build a house with one of these things. Just start pounding nails. It's going to be fine. Uh, how much EQing do you got to do with with these? Are you pretty? Uh, they're pretty flat. Um, this is completely flat. The snare has a, a cut, I don't remember where the cut is, around 250 or 300, somewhere okay. in that ballpark. Uh, the toms have a high-end boost to them to get a, a nice snap out of them. Yeah. Um, 
the there's a lot. I mean, I, I have low pass, uh, sorry, high pass on nearly everything except for the kick and the floor. Uh, even the floor is actually high passed a little bit. And gate and everything too. Uh, so I'm using the the primary source enhanced pansers oh, as okay. the gates. Okay. So I'm not using any traditional gates. Sure. I'm just using the 545 uh, as my gate. So why a uh, primary source enhancer via the like a trigger? Um, well, so <clears throat> I don't want I don't like tight gates. I want things to breathe and kind of be a little natural. Sure. And to me, that the 545, I can adjust that easily to be a, a real natural sound. So it yeah. doesn't have a hard open close. It's a real soft in and out. I don't know. I just I messed around with it when as a plug-in uh, with Waves, and then when I went to the analog rack, I just bought the the actuals and started using those. Uh, what about vocals? Uh, vocals, we are a KSM9 for Patrick and Pete, and a KSM8 for Joe. Okay. So what advice would you give to new engineers starting off that want to be in your position one day? Be a half decent person, maybe even more so than a good engineer. Uh, I mean, being a good engineer definitely matters, but at the end of the day, we're riding in a metal tube with anywhere between eight and 12 other people, eight and 10 of 11 other people. Yeah. And you've got to get along with them. Otherwise you're, you're not going to make it. Like I've, I've probably fired more people for just being stupid. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. Can we curse on this show? I don't know. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. For just being assholes yeah. than anything else. Yeah. You know, like you can be great at your job. If you're, if you're an asshole and hard to live with, you're not going to make it. Yeah. You're going to get fired. And if, but if you're mediocre at your job or, or good at your job and if you're a nice person, you're going to stay like I know there's a lot of my friends who look up to you and are very seasoned engineers. Who, who do you look up to? Who are your oh, uh, Pooch, Annie Meyer, Toby, um, Brad Maddox, Brett Divens. I mean, there's a there's a host uh, of guys that are so good. What is the best piece of advice you got from one of your mentors? Uh, turn down for what? what? <laughs> no, I mean, I think a lot of, I think, yeah, I think a lot of times you come out of the clubs and stuff, you come out and you're trying to mix a, a, an arena show yeah. at 105, 107 dB and it's too loud. Yeah. You know, I mean, at least for me, you know, like I, I, I'm much more in the 101, 102 ballpark. Uh, for me, I, I think the 105 and up, especially in arenas, it just gets, it's too much. Um, but that was probably the best advice I got was because I came out trying to be the big guy and, you know, make it as loud as humanly possible. And that's not always best. So if people want to follow you on social media, or follow your career. Uh, the only social media that I have that's open to anybody is, uh, is uh, Instagram. It's soundman00. Okay. Uh, two O's, not the word. Okay. Um, yeah, Facebook is for us old folks and it's for family and Family and close friends. I heard MySpace is making a comeback, so. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I have to check and see if my account's still active. <laughs> or you can go to a Fallout show near wherever you're at. Yep. Uh, Thank you, man. Be there. I appreciate you so much. Thank you for your you're time. You're awesome. See you guys. <laughs>